Welcome to the Psychedelic Spotlight Podcast. I'm your host this week, Jill Ettinger, Director of Content. Today I catch up with Pierre Bouchard, a licensed professional counselor with private practice in Boulder and Denver, Colorado. Pierre specializes in blending somatics, embodiment, attachment theory, and trauma therapy with ketamine-assisted psychotherapy. In this interview, we chat about what it's like to deliver ketamine therapy and what patients can expect going into a session. This interview was recorded on February 17th, 2021. Hi, Pierre. Welcome to Psychedelic Spotlight Podcast. Hi, it's good to be here. Why don't you tell me a little bit about the work that you do um, as a psychotherapist and, and working with psychedelics? Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm, a, I'm a somatic therapist and I focus on working with trauma and attachment. And um, I've been working with ketamine for about three and a half years. And I'm using ketamine with people to work through trauma and depression. And something I've been really excited about has been exploring the ways in which uh, we can treat some forms of depression as a developmental trauma. What does that mean, a developmental trauma? Something that happens when you're in, uh, under a certain age? Yeah, to a degree, it's that, right? It's, um, it's things that happen in childhood. Um, but the difference, I would say, between sort of a developmental trauma and other traumas is that, you know, one way of understanding it is that uh, normally when we think of trauma, we think of a bad thing that happened that shouldn't have. And in developmental trauma, and trauma, certainly that can be the case, but the other side of it is it's the good thing that didn't happen. Hmm. Right? Wow. That, I, I don't think many people have thought about it that way. Like you, you do think of it as something bad that happened, but that not everything was good either way. What would be some examples of that, things that were missing, those good things? I mean, on a, on a really uh, extreme level, we could think of neglect, right? But um, on a more subtle level, I think it's like, yeah, just having someone who's paying attention to you as a child, someone who's curious about you, someone who's sort of tracking how you're doing as a kid, right? And when you don't have that, the experience is that you're very deeply alone. And that doesn't... Um you know, if you had parents who were maybe absent, but you had friends, you know, peers as a, as a young child, it's not the same. Certainly not. Yeah. And, um, you know, obviously everyone's story is complex and just because we don't get it from parents doesn't mean, you know, there wasn't, there couldn't be a really important grandparent or something in somebody's life. Um, someone who's really keeping an eye out on you and loving you. Um, yeah, there's just a way in which uh, I, I, in interpersonal neurobiology, we like to describe it as feeling felt. It's a great way to, to describe it. Yeah, that we are registering to another person. And so how does that, um, how does ketamine help with that, um, with these developmental traumas? Yeah. Well, ketamine can get used in a wide variety of ways. Um, A lot of ways that it's getting used is that it seems that for a lot of people, um, just the sheer action of the chemical in people's brains can help them um, reduce symptoms of depression. However, those symptoms come back. The way I like to work with ketamine and why I think this is so helpful with things like developmental trauma is that when people are doing ketamine assisted therapy, uh, they're, they're open, you know, the, 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 the medicine just helps them be more open. It helps them be less defended. And in that window, then we're able to go in and just do very deep therapy work and help them access some of those feelings that uh, maybe they haven't accessed before. Do you work with children with ketamine? No, I don't. 
that's sort of un, unexplored territory as far as I can tell. And, you know, I think the future is pretty exciting in that way. Um, but so far, no, I just work with adults. So they're coming in with, um, with depression and maybe not realizing that it's linked to a developmental yeah. trauma or are they coming in with specific or maybe it's a bit of both? I mean, it's a, it's a pretty wide variety of things, but I would say that um, anytime someone comes in to me and says, I've been depressed since grade school, I get real curious about what home life was like. Like, I think this is where the, the larger field of psychiatry has not caught up to date with what we know about trauma yet. And there's these really kind of vestigial views of this bad, bad brain chemistry, right? It's like, oh, we just need to fix the chemistry. It's the chemistry that's off. It's like, well, no, I think we actually have a better idea of what this is. Uh, and it's more complex and it's more nuanced and, um, there's better chances for a change in the outcome too. Can it be, uh, you know, we often think of, of something like you were talking about the, the neglect or, or even cases of abuse are um, situations that persist. How, how often is it that there is just one, you know, traumatic event, you know, absent of the loss of a parent or, or something that monumental that it, that it can, um, trigger some kind of uh, depression episode, either as a child or, or later in life, uh, or is it more these persistent uh, patterns that, that lead to it or behaviors? It's a great question. And you know, what I would say is that, uh, look, we're all very complex, you know? So uh, uh, I, don't, I don't subscribe to any sort of hard and fast rules about any of this. Um, and I think that the amount of, variants of like, yes, yeah, some kids are also just more sensitive than other kids. And so something that one kid might cruise through with could be really derailing for another kid. But I would say that um, the younger something starts to happen, or the younger something is missed, um, the more likely it is that's going to show up in a, you know, uh, a painful way. I mean, human beings are extremely creative in, in the, in the absence of important things or, you know, in the presence of, 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 of bad things, like, look, we're very creative. We're, we creatively adapt to the situation to get by. Um, but right. When it happens from a younger age, more likely that that's going to, create longer, longer term problem for people. And, and so far, I think in psychiatry, we haven't seen good solutions for that. And so I think that's where the, the realm of psychedelic medicine is so important and so exciting. So is this something you introduce to your patients? They come in as uh, seeking therapy and then you all offer this as a track or is this something they come in specifically looking for ketamine treatment? It's a bit of both. I mean, I'm certainly known as a ketamine therapist. And so oftentimes people come to me and, you know, they say like, look, I've tried everything. I've been on these different meds. I've tried these different therapies, nothing's worked. Uh, and so they're interested in ketamine. And for other people, um, you yeah, know, they're sort of more sort of garden variety suffering. And, you yeah, know, we sort of make a determination together and sort of see if, something like ketamine might, might support their unfolding, might support the healing process. And what does that look like? Um, are you there with them for the entirety of the ketamine experience? Do they do that alone? How does that work? Yeah, it's a good question. So the way that I do it is, so one, I'm not a doctor. So they, they would, if we decide we're going to do ketamine work together, they go get a prescription for that from a psychiatrist or a nurse practitioner. And then they come to the office and they take the ketamine and lay on the couch here. And I'm with them the whole time. It's a three hour session. Um, and yeah, the, the, as, as the ketamine comes on and they deepen into that, we get into this, we get into this work and it starts to unfold. And I would say that this is also the case where, you know, 
I don't think psychedelics are a magic bullet. I think they're a fantastic tool. And um, being in my own practice in this way, I have the privilege of getting it, being able to uh, see people for a long time. You know, sometimes we're doing upwards of 20, 20 plus sessions over, over a period of time. And so there's many hours of getting to, to, to be in that space with ketamine and, and therapy where the nervous system's really getting a chance to rewire. And what do, are there specific things that, that each patient goes through, you know, in the arc of a ketamine experience? Are there similarities or are they all uh, vastly unique? It is amazing to me, the range I've seen in, in, in sessions. Um, some people have a very sort of like psychically dismantling experience where they're kind of blown apart and floating in the cosmos and still able to talk somehow. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's sort of, it's big, it's cosmic, it's transpersonal. And then I have other people come in and it's like a, a, a visionary experience where they're transported right back to a, a, some part of their life, often childhood. But it's like they're in the room, they're having, they're seeing just where they were wow. at their time in life. So it can really range. It's pretty, pretty stunning. What's it like for you? I mean, you're there w watching this as a, as a human, um, you know, you certainly are coming at it as a therapist, but you're also a human watching somebody have a, a, a really uh, intense experience. What's that like? And many of them uh, and many different people, what, what's that like for you? I mean, this might sound strange, but I love it. I love, I love being there with people through those things. I love seeing people get to go to places they haven't been able to get to before because I know where it's going. You know, even if they're going to the most hellish place that they've ever, they've never been able to feel in their life. To me, I'm just there celebrating because I know the, the other side of this is a more vibrant life where they're more connected to themselves and the people they love. It's like, uh, you watched, uh, you recorded a basketball game and you know who wins and they're watching, you're watching it with them, but they, they're, they're not sure. <laughs> right. It's like that. <laughs> uh, and, and what is the, um, then the mat, is there a magic number uh, of sessions and, and how long do the benefits seem to last for your, for your patients? No, I wouldn't say there's a magic number. This is where everybody's so different. And people's needs are so different. I have some people where, you know, a handful of sessions really helps them open, open up to and metabolize some really important piece that they weren't able to get to. And for others, um, yeah, it's a longer, it's a longer process of unfolding and deepening. And I would say it really depends on the quality of the wound that they're working with and the age at which that wound occurred. The earlier the wound, the longer the process typically. So you're working with someone um, over multiple uh, sessions. Do they pick up kind of where they left off? Is it a completely new experience? Um, do, they, do they always go back to that, that one trauma or those series of traumas or does it bring up other issues? Well, this is where, you know, I think um, Stan Groff's term is so useful of saying psychedelics are a nonspecific amplifier. Right. And, I would say, and ketamine works in this way as well, and that we may be doing a piece of work over time that has to do around a certain trauma or series of traumas. And yet what's amazing, right, is that it, it, it's also iterative. This is, this, it's, um, it's, not, it's not exactly a linear process here, right? They have an experience, they learn from it. We do an integration session the next week. And when they come back, something's reworking, something's been reworked in their psyche. And so they're then going back into that material from a new place each time. And so uh, what's occurring is that it's like the system's learning and healing as it goes. It's like it's developing more and more resilience over time with the progressive sessions. 
almost like a vaccination series. Like you're getting your immunity kind of builds strength. Do you feel like, uh, do people go, um, you know, unusual lengths of time and then have to kind of start back at zero or does it kind of continue on no matter what the gap from the last session? I've never seen it start start from zero again. Um, I think this is the difference between doing ketamine assisted therapy where this is an unfolding of the psyche that you're helping someone take part in versus um, just giving somebody a drug to reduce symptoms, right? This is their participation in the process. And, and how much do you, would you say it does reduce symptoms? I mean, do you feel like people after a certain, you know, a certain number of sessions that work for them, um, are they, are they cured? Do they need to come back in at a certain interval to kind of get a boost? Like what, what do you consider your um, success rate or your uh, kind of completion rate with your patients or how do you quantify that? It's a good question. I would say completion is really up to them, but I would say that like, if we were trying to use the ketamine just to make them feel better, we could probably, we could probably get some metrics together about how many sessions that often takes and then what kind of maintenance schedule they need to be on in order to maintain that. But because we're using this as, as um, a window into leverage to do really deep therapy, uh, it's a different, it's a different model, right? And so it's like, I'm not looking for uh, a maintenance schedule. I'm looking for remission, right? And it's like we're going to the root of the of the of of the wound so that we can heal that, so that the depression doesn't exist anymore. And you find that's the case. People come out of there uh, essentially cured. Some of the times, absolutely, yeah. Um, I have, I have absolutely seen that occur over time for people. I've seen, I've seen people that have been depressed for decades uh, no longer identify as a depressed person. And were they taking uh, pharmaceuticals for those depressions or they were maybe undiagnosed? Or? I mean, at different points in their life, they did number, a number of things, you know, I'm sure they'd been on, they'd been on meds at different points. They'd been on therapy at different points, but um, you know, the whole time they've been some version of depressed. And that's, and that's the beautiful thing here. When you actually treat the, 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 the original wound and help someone learn some new skills in their nervous system of how to actually go a different way, um, there is a hope of actually curing these things. So does this type of treatment, I mean, you know, the one thing that kind of comes up for me is that, um, we've been told that this, like, and you, you touched on this earlier, that this is maybe a chemical imbalance. We need to just treat this, but it sounds very much like uh, Freud was maybe right. <laughs> and this kind of all goes back to those, those early traumas. Um, is that kind of the consensus? I mean, do we look at, at what he, uh, what he diagnosed as, um, you know, as these original traumas as being the real issue and, 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 and maybe in those very rare cases, it is something chemical in the brain. Certainly it can be chemical or <clears throat> right. Hormonal or, or gastric. I mean, there's many, many reasons. Right. And so, um, but I think more people are getting treated as if this is a chemical imbalance, then, 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 are, then, it, then it is appropriate to treat that way. So in that way, yeah, we're kind of going, we're going old school that this is the, that the way of actually looking at this as early, the impact of early life having a huge part of this. Now we have the benefit of understanding a lot more about neurobiology and how a mind and a psyche and a nervous system wire up and what, what it needs than, than they did, you know, a hundred years ago. And uh, we have a better sense of how to work with trauma. And what about other psychedelics? And, um, you know, Colorado or in Denver, they've decriminalized uh, psilocybin and now laws are, are popping up um, across the country. And then um, you've got a legalization of psilocybin treatment that just happened in Oregon. 
would you uh, move into these other therapies if they became uh, legal in Boulder? And, and if so, which ones and why? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I'm looking forward to, I'm looking forward to that future. I feel very optimistic about it. You know, I think you, you would never say that you're um, uh, a carpenter who just uses a hammer, right? It's like you're a carpenter, you use many tools to build, to build. And in that way, I think we can understand any of the different psychedelic medicines as being skillful means to address different issues. And I'm very much looking forward to a future where we have access to a variety of them and we can begin to have a more nuanced understanding of what medicines at what times and in what context best serve people's healing. Well, thank you so much, Pierre. Really appreciate it. Best of luck in your work. Thank you very much. Global Track Solutions, Inc. and Psychedelic Spotlight does not in any way encourage or condone the use, purchase, sale, or transfer of any illegal substances, nor do we encourage or condone partaking in any unlawful activities. We support a harm reduction approach for the purpose of education and promoting individual and public safety. If you are choosing to use psychedelic substances, please do so responsibly. The views and opinions expressed by the guests on the Psychedelic Spotlight podcast are those of their own and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Psychedelic Spotlight and Global Track Solutions, Inc.